I'm Dr. Clyde Herod. I'm here in a typical university classroom, an amphitheater with fixed seats. Professor stands here, lecturing nonstop for an hour or two in front of the blackboard. And the students sit in seats, passively writing down the notes. The method works well for certain students. These are our survivors. Clearly fails miserably, however, for other students. These are our D and F students. Now what's wrong here? Is it the students that are at fault, or is it the method? Today I would like to tell you about a brand new method called team learning. There are no lectures, and the students work in small groups, and they do learn better than any other method I know. This video will demonstrate the ingredients necessary for effective team learning with case studies. The method, which was first developed by Larry Michelson, includes reading assignments, the application of principles learned in the reading assignments, individual quizzes and group tests, immediate test results, and appeals. To understand how these techniques are put into action, we'll watch the beginning of a summer school evolutionary biology class. These students are expecting to listen and take down notes, but instead of the traditional format, they're met with something new and different, team learning. The um, course is all done in small groups. You'll stay in those groups and everything's done within those groups. 75% of the students' grades will still be derived from individual scores, but 25% of it will come from teamwork. It's a concept which makes some students happy. And then when you hear them say, you get to work in groups, you're like, yes, the world just you know, like brightens up and you're, you're, you're so glad. But other students worry about whether they can count on their group members. Like tardiness of a group member, um, maybe not letting everyone share, uh, not being prepared. The major fear that they have, uh, I think, is that this is an unknown method uh, to them. They have that fear, a general fear. Then they have the specific fear is can they count on their buddies that are going to be part of the team to do that, their share of the teamwork. To make the method work, the students must understand it's to their benefit. The grades are higher. Uh, in fact, in this system, most of my grades are A's and B's, whereas in a normal class, of course, there are many C's and D's and F's. Do you know that in the summer, 95% of the people get A's and B's? Hear it? Think about that. And that's because group work is better than the individual lecture method. For many, lectures simply don't work. Yeah, the lecture is rough sometimes, especially yeah. if we had to do it for two hours, you know? Yeah. So I'm glad that we heard the thing going. I'm trying to like repair my average because yeah. I did bad in this class. This is my second time taking it. He said, and then, you know, everybody had D's and F's and C's or whatever. I had like me and all my buddies, so taking it again. However, group learning does not necessarily produce higher scores on standardized tests compared to the lecture method. The two teaching methods produce equal results on standardized tests. But you say, well, then why go through this agony of doing this new methodology then? Well, the answer is it does a lot of other things better. One, it produces people that retain the information better. If you talk about it in small groups, you make it your own information rather than me saying something, you writing it down on your notes, you think you have it, and you turn around and you can't explain it worth a darn. Beyond better learning, the so students will also learn here, important life skills. In 1989, there was a, a fellow named Pettit who decided to do a, a survey of 35 colleges and universities, asked the alumni that had been to school for several years and graduated, been successful or not, and asked the, the, this particular question, what's the single most important reason that pe su people succeed in your business? The answer is, from 85% of them said, working together well in groups. Amazing, huh? 
what's this? and the second question that was a follow-up to this was, of the time that you spent in school working on the various aspects of your career and skill development, how much time did you spend in the formal classroom learning that most important skill that you claim was leading to success? And the answer from virtually everybody is zero time. That's terrible. If that's the situation, we need to spend some time on teamwork. And the first step in teamwork is establishing effective teams. The students the must be divided into groups. CDs, However, cards, they are not divided randomly. The students fill out index cards, listing their major, grade point average, and the number of math and science classes they've had. Then, Professor Herod forms groups of four to five students. The way you decide the groups, the way I decide them, is to collect information about the people because I want diversity. The normal way that you would want to group the function, I think, is to have different opinions that are present. Ready? Move! Once the groups are formed, it's important to establish expectations and consequences for bad behavior. They begin by discussing the pros and cons of group work. A con is people don't do the work, they don't keep up to the principle of the group. Attendance is always a problem. I've been in a lot of group work, and yeah. it, it, like if the group gets along and they all take responsibility for it, it makes things wonderful. It's, yeah. it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of fun, you learn the material a little better, and I get more out of it. But it, like a couple times I've gotten myself in a situation where I end up doing most of the work, and it's not necessarily that other people don't want to do it, but I just like I hate relying on people, so I'm just like, I'll do it, I'll do it. To make sure each student pulls his weight, a peer evaluation is built into the final grade. Peer evaluation is where you have to fill out this form at the end of the semester about how you would grade the effort put in by your group members. And the method is that uh, if you're in a group of four, everybody gets 30 points to distribute among the other members of the group. And if a group is working perfectly, uh, I would be giving my partners 10 points, 10 points, 10 points. And the average would be 10 if everybody did the same thing in that group. And that means the group is working effectively as, as far as the group members are concerned. But uh, you know, on a scale where you have 30 points to give, you might now decide that somebody called Sally in your group is not pulling her weight. And you want, may only want to give her eight points. And you may want to give Tom uh, 12 points. Uh, and so if everybody else feels the same way, you've got somebody called Sally that isn't pulling her weight. And uh, she's not going to get all the group points that that group has earned. She's only going to get 80% of them. And so the peer evaluation that they know is coming at the end of the semester is a way of rectifying the effort, or at least compensating for the effort. The person that's done more work will get a higher percentage of the group points. Got these peer evaluations? The single most important criterion of why somebody may get a low peer evaluation is absence. And the, and the other one that counts is lateness. Anybody that tends to be absent without any excuse, or even with an excuse, okay, will hurt your group and your group will in fact count this against you. There's no divorces here. You're living with these people okay, for at least six weeks. You got to make it work. It's the it's a lifeboat situation. You you don't get to throw them out. Okay. The students create a list of rules which will be further refined after a few classes, giving the students time to see firsthand the effects of tardiness and absence. Get the rules down and the sanctions, if they break the rules, what do you want to have happen to them? And I don't mean terrible, but I mean what do you think it should be a reasonable rule? And then what happens if somebody breaks it? Always complete delegated work somewhere. Yeah, I think we should have one fun punishment. <laughs> we all reap the benefit. We're bringing the cupcakes next week. <laughs> it's now day two of the summer evolutionary biology class. The students have moved to a small classroom instead of the large, sloping auditorium. This kind of room is far more conducive to team learning. The amphitheater arrangement uh, where everybody is tiered uh, above you uh, is awkward in every sense. It's better to have everybody on the same level. 
They begin the class by taking a quiz on reading material they've done outside of class. When you have a test every day, obviously you know that the students have to have read the material. It, it encourages them to actually do the reading. As soon as they're done, they will break into their groups and take the same quiz together. The, the group test then is another way of essentially giving feedback to the students when they talk to their buddies about the problem they've just grappled with in an individual test. They validate uh, their own thoughts on this or at least try them out. And once they hear difference of opinion, they may modify their scores. See, I hate that. Wasn't I the one that said stick with your first guess? I hate myself right now. Okay. When the students finish, they get to see their scores and the correct answers immediately by using an electronic scoring machine called a Scantron. The Scantron is a um, uh, somewhat of a, a gimmick. Uh, the students like to actually grade their own scores. They like the act of, of processing it. You'll see even when they're up there that they uh, get a lot of pleasure out of it and it's just plain fun. Good, that's what 100% sounds like. So remember that sound. Oh, it was, yeah. you were right. I think I'll throw my score out and keep this one. Did the group, group scores better? I got a 92 on my own and a 98 with the group. As an individual, I got an 82, and with the group, we got a 98. So the group score was obviously better. But five minds are better than one. The students have a chance to appeal the questions they answered incorrectly. If the question was ambiguous or the text was not clear, they may write an appeal. However, the person writing the appeal must convince the entire group that it's valid and all group members must sign off on it. I'm just going to say it wasn't used in the text in an obvious way. You use appeals for a couple of different reasons. One is the question might not be an ideal question. Lots and lots of times a professor thinks he's written the finest question in the world only to find out that there are people that interpret it more than one way. And so the appeal then allows the students to feel somewhat empowered um, and also allows you to recognize that this may be a faulty question. It has the added advantage is that when they are looking up the answer to challenge you, they often find out, oh, well, the teacher was right after all. And it really inspires a certain amount of critical thinking because to write a good appeal requires that they, in fact, have thought this through pretty well. You're not going to take the appeals personally, are you? Well, if you're a gentle and kind, we'll make sure Amanda's name's up at the top. <laughs> Big bold letters, underline it, star it. Amanda's a I was nice. Yeah. Okay. She was clear and concise. Yes. Once the test taking is done, it's time to apply the principles the students have learned from their reading. They've read a case study involving a famous fossil called Archaeopteryx, a transitional species between reptiles and birds. It's a discovery which helps strengthen Darwin's argument for evolution. The particular case that I uh, have written has to do with a paleontologist uh, from Yale, who um, many years later, after the discovery, found in a fossil collection in the Netherlands uh, something that was thought to be a flying reptile by the name of a pterosaur. He went to this particular museum thinking it was a pterosaur and discovered that it was in fact a uh, Archaeopteryx. It was a specimen that had been in fact found before the original specimen had been, except it had been misnamed clearly. The case study is the springboard for the students to learn about fossils, evolution, and archaeopteryx. Each group must compare pigeon and chicken skeletons to the archaeopteryx fossil. I'm going to show this to you each because this is a plaster cast of archaeopteryx, and it's sort of nice to see that. Look at these rear extending shoulder blades right here. He doesn't have anything like that. No. Check in the picture. No. So, no shoulder blades? Shoulder blades, yeah. Pigeon, uh, pigeon has shoulder blades. Pigeon has very large shoulder blades. The way the neck is connected to the skull, that's a difference. You notice right here. Two, three, four, five, six, it's directly seven, eight, attached nine, right behind the skull, and that's attached under it. It engaged them at an active level, and this is part of the key to, I think, great teaching is active learning, and uh, that's the doing of something in a classroom rather than to sit there passively. So, I think it's a fantastic 
fantastically good uh, method to engage them, uh, and they have this storyline that guides them in the, and drives it forward. They're not just making the comparison, but they're making a comparison that other biologists and, and paleontologists have had to make before to come to the conclusion that this looks like a transitional species. Hands-on learning like this takes a lot of time, but it's time well spent. The benefit is that you remember the material better. I mean, it's as simple as that. Why, uh, why get a discussion going? Because you remember the information better in the context of a discussion. You make the information your own if you have to say it out loud. If you simply are writing down what a professor says, you are taking his ideas and his thoughts and his words and writing them down. They're not your thoughts. They're not your words. And so simply you have to reframe these to make them your own. And if you can't restate this in your own words, you don't have it. Another reason the students will remember the information is because the case study they've read is compelling. The students have learned that Yale scientist John Ostrom recognized a misidentified Archaeopteryx fossil during a museum visit to Holland. He now has found a, a fossil that's been misidentified. He now would like the, the credit and the glory of this, just like all of us would. On the other hand, if he tells the curator this, the curator has every right to say, thank you for, very much, Professor, for bringing this to our attention. We'll take it from here, and we'll describe it, and that museum and that curator will get the credit for that. So it's a personal dilemma of whether he should reveal this or not, or just simply to ask to borrow the specimens. If he asks to borrow the specimens and he's granted that, he'll take them back to his lab, and then he will describe it, and he'll say, aha, I have found that this is a new specimen, then it's logical for him to describe it, and there wouldn't be much quarrel about that. But if he does it right there on the spot, there's a good chance that the guy will say thank you very much and pick the specimens up and walk away, which is in fact what he did do. He picked the specimens up and walked away. And that's the end of the story as far as the students are concerned. And the, uh, it looks like on the last page of that case, he, uh, the guy is thinking to himself, you blew it, John, you blew it. The students have been left with this cliffhanger for days, and they're dying to know what happened to paleontologist John Ostrom. Ostrom, should he have told the truth? How is it not telling the truth if he doesn't say anything, he just says, can I borrow it? and just go like feel it out. It's not like he's lying, he just didn't say it. I would have told the truth, it was their specimen, it wasn't his, just That's because right. he found it. So, but uh, you, what, what would you do? So I still would have, I would have said something. I would have told him just like he did. So you do what Ostrom did, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't tell him anything. I would just move him over the information. Okay. Folks, listen up. I would have known a lot. You're, you're Ostrom. You have to make a decision. How many of you vote to tell the guy like Ostrom did? Hands up. Hands up. Okay, how many of you choose to withhold information and just say, I'd like to borrow this specimen? Come on, Amanda. Come on, Amanda. I can't vote. <laughs> okay, and those of you that haven't she voted just are just plain pocket. chickens. <laughs> it turns out that the guy came back a few minutes later with a shoebox and the specimens wrapped up and see, said, here, doctor, you have made our museum famous. Take them home and describe them. Yes. He did the right thing and, uh, and uh, he gets the credit. While this method of teaching may not cover as much ground as a typical lecture, the students are more likely to retain the information this way. Uh, of course, the key is what good does it do if you teach this material and the students don't remember it and don't get it. Uh, coverage, just because you've covered it, uh, is not the, the real answer. You'd like to be able to cover it and have them actually remember it. So I think that that's one of the benefits of the, of the methodology. For some professors, this type of teaching may feel awkward. They may think, if I'm not talking, I must not be doing my job. Your work comes in the very beginning, before you walk into the classroom, much more extensively than in a lecture. Uh, when you have a normal lecture already prepared, an average faculty member might pick out that lecture material uh, from this folder and look at it uh, maybe for 30 minutes before he walks into a lecture. Um, 
you can't do that in this kind of preparation because you have a whole lot of uh, work ahead of time. You're doing a lot more grading, for instance, than you ever would in a normal lecture. Clearly, all these papers that are being handed in, uh, you're spending significant time before, hand, and after the lecture, uh, lecture period. That homework is collected inside group folders, which act as a catch-all for everything from appeals to scores. In this environment, students are well aware of one another's grades. Uh, as you notice, though, the students have no difficulty sharing information. They're up there at the Scantron together. They're having a, a, essentially a good time to some extent, uh, saying, what do you have, what do you have? So they all know one another's scores because they choose to share it in that situation. learning not only increases enthusiasm about the course, but reduces absenteeism. If this was a lecture class, you can honestly say that uh, you can afford to miss a class, which is uh, it's not beneficial to the student, you know. So uh, I missed Monday's class. Um, I came here, I got here yesterday. Um, so what I did was I had to get the information for class because uh, from what I heard, we were going to have a group discussion and I didn't want to be left out, so I went and met my group members, I went to his house and I got the information, so it somewhat like motivates you and like it forces you to like get the information, you know? If students don't show up, they hurt the group. For instance, on this day, two people out of a group of four did not show up. Absenteeism had an undeniable effect. It probably would have been higher if we had other people, because then we had more information and different opinions from other people. Maybe they definitely know an answer they can prove, or they just for sure that they're very confident on their answer. So we might have changed something on our answer sheet or something like that. While group members are usually afraid to let others down, Sometimes that's not enough incentive, which is why peer evaluations are a critical component in team learning. If you're late or you're absent, you're going to get a low peer evaluation and, and uh, obviously this affects your group grade. Even though students might not understand the importance of these issues when they make their list of rules during the first class, they soon realize absenteeism and lateness matter. And both problems disappear after a few classes. For example, students who come in late are not available to help their teammates take tests. This is why it's helpful to revisit the rules after a couple classes. How could you think that being on time is like a bad rule? I mean, what's up with that? But at least, what's going to happen when you graduate you have a job? What, are you going to show up a half hour late every day? Two minutes late. Two minutes late. It's traffic. It's traffic. I don't think it's traffic. Because when I came in today, I didn't finish. I finished um, before, like, not before everybody, but, you know, at a reasonable time. Well, all right. Begin plan for class. How about excessive lateness? All right, excessive lateness. All right. All right, so what's the penalty for that? Decapitation. Decapitation? I'm okay with that, man. <laughs> if you're late all the time, then we're going to yell at you, and your penalty will be for the next lab. You'll have to read the lab ahead of time and explain to the rest of us. That don't mean that's, that's good. Fine. Okay. Okay. A preview peer evaluation early in the course can make students aware if they're headed for a bad peer review. If you're going to give group projects, you must have, I feel, a peer evaluation, some way to compensate for people that are social loafers that aren't doing their job. But you do everything you can ahead of time to try to stop that from ever occurring. One way to do that is to give this peer evaluation as a practice part way through the term. And again, the peer evaluation is anonymous. I'm the only person that sees it. Any student who's in jeopardy of receiving a low group evaluation should be pulled aside and told privately. This practice is very important, uh, essentially, to, to, uh, to offset any bad behavior, because you want to correct the bad behavior. You don't want this to show up in the final analysis of the grade. You want them to fix it. You don't want a bad group. With the mechanics in place, team learning can be a great experience for students. I can honestly say I'm learning uh, a little easier. This class uh, helps you learn the material rather than just absorb it and, you know, regurgitate it, you know. 
Once again, the key to successful team learning requires these steps. Diverse teams, engaging reading assignments, individual and group tests, a chance for appeals, compelling case studies, and peer evaluations to make sure the groups are working effectively. For teachers, team learning with case studies may seem intimidating at first. If you're going to want to try something like team learning or use of case studies, you have to recognize there's a significant investment of time at the very outset. But once you have the materials down, you are in pretty much the same position as you are with a lecture. It takes a long time to prepare lectures as well. So if you have your lectures already, you are going to have to commit a large block of time to retool your courses. But it's an investment that pays off because students learn better, remember longer, and enjoy the experience more. What better reward can there be? I love to lecture and I worked hard to become effective at it. This is a different style and the reason I do it is because it's also fun. Fun in a completely different way. Uh, I don't get the same kind of ego satisfaction from it in, in terms of being a, a performer. But I get a lot of strong satisfaction in terms of writing cases, uh, getting to know my students a lot better. I know students extraordinarily well in this situation. And the moment that I first started doing this, I began to realize, oh, these are my students. And I had looked at them merely as sort of an audience before, but now I see them as individuals. And so it's one of the great liberating facts about teaching is now you get to know your students really, really well and know them as human beings. And that's a great pleasure. Mm -hmm.